What's up? I am David Long. I am here today to bring you a special excerpt from my semantic compatibilism video. This one in particular is about spiritual experiences and idealistic and materialistic cosmology and metaphysical perspectives. So this 40 minute video doesn't really do it complete justice. Make sure that if you're interested in this, that you check out the semantic compatibilism video to hear a lot more. So now I want to talk for a little bit about spiritual experiences and some of the claims and ideas around some of this stuff. For a lot of people, this is some of the most important, most meaningful experiences of their whole life. This is the whole point of some of these phenomenological or mystical contemplative perspectives. The main thing that they're thinking about are these altered states and mystical experiences. So that can range from anything from the type of transformative life experience that a person would have from a mind-blowing psychedelic trip to the kind of transformative realizations that a Christian might feel during a worship or a revival or something like that to the kind of existential awakening that a Buddhist or a person who's practicing meditation might experience when they enter into some of these altered states. So what I'm really talking about here is the amazing power of this transformative experience and this existential awakening, this ability that comes from these different traditions of being able to sort of start over or redefine your interpretation of self or expand your notion of self to include more than just your your simple like body mind ego but your perspective expands and your care expands and that's why people are so attached to these experiences and see them as so important in their life because these are the experiences that have really helped a person to change their life i'm a person who has had these experiences. I'm a person who has practiced and gotten into these particular meditative states and had very similar experiences that probably at the time I interpreted in a very similar way. But here I am as a person who's had these experiences and I don't think of them in that way anymore. And I can still get into these states. It's something I still practice, but I don't interpret the symbol in a literal way. I interpret the symbol in a metaphorical way, in the light of all the other types of symbols I've seen and how I understand the symbol in its context in terms of human development and that particular culture. There are so many different creation stories. In the West, in the Abrahamic tradition, God is out there, some intelligence that created the world. In the East, God is in here. And we're all in this collective dream in the mind of God. I mean, those are totally different. Which one do I believe is more true? Neither. I don't think that either one of those types of claims is really in, in anybody's ability to make claims about based on some kind of religious experience. We don't yet know whether the universe is open or closed. More than that, there are a few astronomers who doubt that the redshift of distant galaxies is due to the Doppler effect, who are skeptical about the expanding universe and the Big Bang. Perhaps our descendants will regard our present ignorance with as much sympathy as we feel to the ancients for not knowing whether the Earth went around the sun. If the general picture, however, of a Big Bang followed by an expanding universe is correct, what happened before that? Was the universe devoid of all matter and then the matter suddenly, somehow created? How did that happen? In many cultures, the customary answer is that a god or gods created the universe out of nothing. But if we wish to pursue this question courageously, we must, of course, ask the next question. Where did God come from? If we decide that this is an unanswerable question, why not save a step and conclude that the origin of the universe is an unanswerable question? Or, if we say that God always existed, 
why not save a step and conclude that the universe always existed, that there's no need for a creation, it was always here. These are not easy questions. Cosmology brings us face to face with the deepest mysteries, with questions that were once treated only in religion and myth. Having a religious experience doesn't prove the absolute truth about the origins of the universe or the nature of reality or any of that kind of stuff. If you're making those kind of claims, you're going too far. You're trying to qualify the unqualifiable. Now, if we're talking about how we're going to treat each other or this higher level of thinking that comes online, you know, you can talk about that in the poetry of Buddhism, which likes to talk about this I amness or this authentic self, or you can talk about it in the language of existentialism, where you could say, that self is just a concept in the mind, that self is an illusion, that there is no self, that really what we are in a materialistic way, which is a proven fact in real narrow science or whatever you want to call it, that we are connected, we are interconnected, as we mentioned before. So the things that are true within this tradition, we like them because they're true, like unity. And those are things that we don't need mystical experiences to know about. And then a lot of these other things are claims about the absolute, which no one can really actually know. So it seems to me that these religious traditions give us useful spiritual technologies, but I'm not sure that they really tell us the truth of reality. It depends on what the claim is. What's the claim that we're making? What are we saying that this really means? We can talk about how things make us feel, what we experience. It's one thing to speak about the truth of your subjective experience. It's a whole other thing to start making claims about the truth of objective reality. That is stepping beyond what's appropriate or what kind of data could be even produced through these experiences. The interpretation of a state says more about you and where you're at in your own personal development than it does actually about the truth of reality. And this is where we get into the Wilbur Combs matrix. If you look at the great traditions, they all agree that there are at least four, usually five, major states of consciousness that everybody has access to. Waking, dreaming, deep sleep are the simplest. I'm writing this just across the top as gross, subtle, causal, and non-dual. The waking state, dreaming state, deep, formless sleep state, what we find is that if you take somebody at a particular stage of development, and here I'm using the simple Gene Gebser stages, so I've written archaic, magic, mythic or traditional, rational or modern, pluralistic or postmodern, and integral or higher, and again there are several higher stages, we're not saying that integral is the, the very highest, but this is enough for us to work with. You can be at a traditional mythic stage, and if you experience these states, you'll interpret it in those terms because you only have the mind to interpret what's arising. And so we get a grid here that shows these, in this case, one, two, three, four, five, six, 24 different types of spiritual experience that you can have. In the gross waking state, if we look, if we look at states just very briefly to show what's involved, in the waking state, for example, you might have a peak experience where you're one with everything that's arising. And that's often called nature mysticism. In the dream state, though, one of the first things you notice about the dream state, the way that Vedanta and Pajriyana define it, is there's no gross objects. There's no physical body, there's no nature, there's no Gaia. It's just a subtle realm of images and light and feelings and emotions. And that's a kind of deity mysticism, if you feel one with luminosity or light that's not merely from the physical realm. So that subtle deity mysticism is typical of a dream state peak experience. And deep formless state of peak experience, there's classic formless mysticism or cessation of the vast earth sprung, the, the, the emptiness out of which everything springs, the emptiness out of which everything springs, the emptiness out of which everything springs. And meditative states that are just formless, like nervi, kalpa, samadhi, or nirod, or nirvana, all of those N-I-R prefixes mean without or not. So it means, again, just that vast formlessness with no objects arising at all. And the non-dual ever-present is that which is aware of all of these. And it's one with everything that's arising. So it's sometimes confused with nature mysticism, which it shouldn't be, because that's just oneness with gross objects. 
But non-dual can be one with subtle objects and causal. And so it's ever-present, 24-7, timeless noticing of everything that's arising. If you have a peak experience, as I was saying, let's say you're at the mythic stage or wave of development, and you have an experience of a subtle being of light. And you come from a culture that's Christian, you very likely interpret that as Jesus, perhaps. And because you're at an ethnocentric level of development, you will believe that unless somebody has an experience of Jesus, they can't be saved. It's a very, very common thing that happens. You can be at the rational level of development, like Bertrand Russell was, for example, and he had an experience of uh, nature mysticism, but he interpreted it, of course, in rational terms. That's, just sort of, that's almost all you can do. And if you experience these states, you'll interpret it in those terms. Because you only have the mind to interpret what's arising. It's very common. It's culturally molded. If you're in, in um, China or in Southeast Asia and you have an experience of light, it might very well have 10,000 arms. It might very well be Avalokiteshvara. You're never going to find a Southern Baptist seeing 10,000 arms. I mean, it's just very, very rare. So this is why, to some extent, I think we have to be a hard agnostic. Because when it comes to the absolute, the way to know it is not going to be through some subjective experience. Any understanding of an experience that you have, any words that you could say about an experience of the absolute, is absolutely wrong. And there's no way out of that hermeneutic circle of interpretation. There's no view from nowhere. There's no getting outside of everything. Going to a place where your mind is still doesn't tell you anything. Enlightenment leaves everything exactly the way it finds it. The enlightened mind is the mirror mind. The mirror mind leaves everything exactly the way it finds it. It doesn't change anything. Looking at your still mind doesn't help you to see anything. And it's when you come back into your mind and you start to think about or interpret that experience, that's when it gets culturally molded. That's when you take whatever ideas you happen to have at the time and you try to explain it in terms of those. That's where we go wrong in understanding what these experiences are and understanding the reality that we live in. So this can be majorly problematic. So not only can these experiences be majorly transformative, they can be majorly confusing and stifling. So as most of you know, I do consider myself to be an integralist, and I am a huge fan of the work of Ken Wilber. I've learned so much from him over the years. He's really expanded my thought process on a lot of complicated issues, and I feel real grateful to him. What it means to be an integral practitioner is to take into account these main factors. Quadrants, levels, lines, states, and types. But just because we agree that all of these are factors, doesn't mean that we agree about the details within any of these factors, or we share an overarching worldview. And so there are many ways that I agree with Wilbur about what the factors are, but we have different interpretations of the data. Ken Wilbur started doing this work 30 years ago, and so he's not the final word on what it is to be an integralist. He's the first word on what it is to be an integralist. I think over time we can get more and more accurate integral perspectives as we continue to apply the methodology. There's a false assumption about science operating here. Science is not in principle committed to the idea that there's no afterlife or that the, the mind is identical to the brain right. or that materialism is true. Science is completely open to whatever in fact is true and if it's true that the consciousness is dissociated from the brain of death, that would be part of our growing scientific understanding of the world if we could discover it. And there's, there are ways we could, in fact, discover that if it were true. The problem is there are very good reasons to think it's not true. And we know this from now 150 years of neurology where you damage areas of the brain and faculties are lost. And they're clearly, it's not that everyone with brain damage has their soul perfectly intact. They just can't get the words out. Everything about your mind can be damaged by damaging the brain. You can cease to recognize faces, you can cease to know the names of animals, but you still know the names of tools. The fragmentation in the way in which our, our mind is parcelated at the level of the brain is not at all intuitive, and, had, and there's a lot known about it. And what we're being asked to consider is that you damage one part of the brain, 
and, and subjectivity is lost. You damage another and, and, and yet more is lost. And yet if you damage the whole thing at death, we can rise off the brain with all our faculties intact, recognizing grandma and speaking English. So does the thought create the molecule or the molecule create the thought? Are, are they simultaneous expressions of a deeper transcendent reality that we are inseparable? He's just described an experiment where you can actually answer that question. If I give you a shot of oxytocin and it changes your level of trust, then, the, then the, it's not just mere correlation. I mean, we've run, the, we've run it both ways. And but so that's I what can increase trust and it can generate yeah, oxytocin yes, okay. too. But, but if trust is just the brain in one state, then you have the brain influencing its future states. You haven't gotten out of the brain and got an, a, an, an ectoplasm. Trust or a, or is a, the subjective experience of consciousness. Oxytocin is the objective experience yes, okay, of consciousness. Yes, okay, but what you seem to be expressing is a deeper skepticism about whether the brain is even involved. No, the brain uh, is involved. No, your consciousness likes brains to express itself. Okay, but do you believe, for instance, that do we have souls or that our mind is somehow independent of the brain that will lift off the brain at death and go elsewhere? Is that I believe the there's a transcendent proposing? core consciousness that is comprised of meanings, context, relationships, archetypal ideas that recycles itself, just like everything else recycles okay. so itself. So it's, it's in no sense a product of the brain? It's, uh, it's no sense a product of the brain, and our whole endeavor in spiritual discipline is to actually go beyond that personal consciousness, that ego consciousness, so we can identify with that transcendent reality, which is the source of space, time, energy, and everything else that exists. Okay, you just said that consciousness and mind are... I didn't say consciousness and mind. I no, said no, no. mind is a product of consciousness. Okay, but what okay? this, this, this subjectivity is independent of the objectivity of the brain. There is a subjectivity which is independent of objects. But there's a subjectivity yes, okay. which is subjectivity of itself. When you're looking at the brain for consciousness, you're not looking at consciousness. You're looking at synaptic firings. In fact, yes, it is your yes, consciousness yes. that is looking okay. at those synaptic okay. firings. All right, let's just... Let's just, keep, let's just keep that in view, all right? There are two things that an incomplete science of consciousness and the mind should want to say about that. One is that having an experience of undivided consciousness does not tell you what consciousness really is or what its relationship with the brain really is. There's nothing about introspection that leads you to sense that your subjectivity is at all dependent or even related to voltage changes and chemical interactions going on inside your head. You can drop acid, you can meditate for a year, you can do whatever you want to perturb your nervous system. You can, you can feel yourself to be one with the universe, and at no point in that transformation do you get a glimpse that there's a hundred trillion neurons in your head, or synapses in your head, that, that are doing anything. It's called okay? binding. No, it's not. It's called absolute subjective ignorance of what's actually going on outside to consciousness. <laughs> He's so dismissive no, no. of subjective experience. I'm not, I'm not remotely dismissive of it. Which has given rise to poetry, to music, to art. So dismissive De of subjectivity. I'm saying that the Deepak, whole universe not, is imbued with subjectivity. There's nothing more important than subjectivity. It's all Thank we you. could possibly care about. The, 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 the fabric of our experience, of co our, the changes in our conscious experience, are all we care about. And they have some relation to the physical universe. Absolutely. Okay, now, the question is... They give is, rise to the physical universe. Okay, that is a statement of metaphysics that is totally unjustified and cannot possibly be That's justified... That's why it's a statement based, of metaphysics, not of physics. On, no, no, metaphysical statements also have to be justified, as it turns out. <laughs> metaphysics uh, statements come from subjective experiences. No, metaphysical statements also have to be justified, as it turns out. See how it comes back to this claim about the spiritual experience? And he doesn't explain how or why he thinks his spiritual experience helps him to know that. Sam Harris actually does a really good job of not only showing us the limits of our perspective, but also the power of science to be able to expand our perspective and show us more of how things actually work. So remember earlier when we were talking about the Wilbur Combs matrix and the different states of consciousness, waking dream and deep sleep, whenever you hear some of these more idealistic perspectives talking about consciousness as the ground of all being. The ground of all being. What they're talking about is this idea 
that pure stillness is actually the foundation of the universe, that pure consciousness is actually the foundational element out of which everything comes. This ongoing, ever-present knowingness called I amness, it's, and it existed now, five minutes ago, and before the Big Bang, and before the universe was, I am. And that is the fundamental, absolute secret of the great traditions. That I amness is the only thing that exists. Everything else is a modification, a ripple, an arising. I amness is ongoing, unchanging, ever present. So, first there's this pure consciousness, and then, kind of like in Plato's cave, there's this platonic realm of perfect archetypes that emerges up out of this still empty consciousness. And then it's sort of like the imperfect shadows of those archetypes bubble up into the material manifest gross reality. It's once attention is riveted away from the shadows in the cave, mm -hmm. as if they're real, right. then you start to be open to light of various other sorts. And it's not hallucinatory. No. It's more real. So for them, consciousness is the foundation of reality. Trying to get in touch with absolute reality and you experience this emptiness and openness because it's the space in which everything is arising right now. And matter is a byproduct of consciousness, of imagination. This is also why Tibetan monks practice lucid dreaming. They believe that when they're in that dream state that they're actually in that subtle realm of existence. And they think <laughs> when they die in their gross body, they'll have to navigate through the bardo realm, which is this subtle realm of archetypes. And then at that point, if they're practiced enough, they could navigate to find a reincarnation somewhere else, or they could dip back down into pure I amness and stillness and just dissolve back into source. But the bodhisattvas have dedicated themselves to take new reincarnations until the whole world is enlightened. So this is a deep part of some of the Eastern traditions. And I'm sure you're familiar with the very similar version of intelligent design and creationism in the more Western versions of the tradition. And again, even in the Western tradition, life is evil, sinful, fallen, something to be corrected. Both of these traditions tend to demonize life and being here and manifest reality as fallen or sinful or illusory. They tend to overemphasize the absolute. And it's interesting both the Christians and the Buddhists tend to project the products of evolution, like intelligence or consciousness, as the source of it. Well, it must have been an intelligent person who did all this for a reason. That kind of reasoning. But in a materialistic cosmology, consciousness is a byproduct of matter. It's something that evolves. It's something that happens over time. There was a time in history where the earth was bare and there wasn't any life on it. There was a time, if you believe in the Big Bang, that there was just a bunch of light and energy. Maybe the most simplest of basic fundamental particles were first, first coming together. There was a point at which there was no consciousness. Not as awareness or as what, what you and I would think of as consciousness but there was just chemistry and consciousness is something that has evolved. So the difference between the idealistic and materialistic perspective is the idealistic perspective is rooted in the causal and moves up from causal to subtle to gross. And it's the exact opposite in the materialistic perspective. It starts with the gross, moves to the subtle and the causal. I'm actually just now realizing that even probably this terminology is rooted in idealism. Like the causal, like the cause of it all, and the gross, like a way to reduce 
the regular reality to just like base or something like that, you know what I mean? So maybe even these terms need to be reworked just like some of the terms from the quadrants might need to be reworked. Now when Wilbur is talking about the tetra arising of quadrants, he's talking about the tetra arising of the quadrants in the material manifest gross reality. But he is saying that upper left quadrant consciousness is primary. So I don't know if that's exactly tetra arising. So you remember the quadrants. One of Ken Wilber's other ideas is called tetra arising, meaning they all arise at once. Tetra, the four quadrants arising. The tetra arising of the quadrants, for those of you who like big words and terminology. But the idea is, is that all the way up and all the way down, all of these holons, all the, all the levels that are both simultaneously holes and parts, that's the definition of a holon. This nested nature of reality, subatomic particles within atoms, within molecules, within cells, within organisms, within planets, within galaxies. There's always interiors and exteriors. It's always an individual that's a part of a collective, all the way down. I would say that there's tetra arising in sentient holons, that is, in living conscious beings, there is the tetra arising of the quadrants, but I don't think the tetra arising of the quadrants goes all the way back. I think there was a long time when it was basically just stuff, and then the interior quadrants developed and grew with life. So let's think about the quadrants in terms of a mechanistic metaphor for a second. The fundamental quadrant, if you're a materialist, I would say is the lower right quadrant, which is energy and power. This is the animating force of everything. And vibrating energy manifests as matter. So it's like out of the other side of a black hole or a quantum singularity or whatever it was, be it a local event or the birth of our universe. The whole universe was a vibrating energy field that became material. Some of these bits of material came together, this hardware, and started to develop software. That animating force moved through the hardware to animate the software. Then you had different elements that both had similar software and then they'd work together to upgrade their software over time. So this is a materialistic way of talking about how the quadrants actually unfolded to the point to where something like tetra arising could happen. Life is really complicated stuff. The more complicated it got, the more capacities came online. So in considering this question of when did life begin or when does the life get in, you know, think about human development. It's pretty amazing to think that even in our own lifetimes, not only have we had to develop up starting from stage one up to whatever stage we're at of cognitive development through cultural conditioning and whatnot, we've also had to develop up through every stage of biological evolution, in a sense, all the way back to just a few cells. And if you think even before that, where does the life get in? The mother gets her embryos at eight weeks of human development when she was an embryo herself. And the man has a factory in his testes, basically building these sperms. The mom and the dad are both alive, so maybe there's kind of an infinite regress there. And in that case, we can refer back to the previous videos to kind of show that the origins of life were chemistry in that case. It seems like the origins of life were chemistry also in our case, as individuals, that it all started with chemistry. And so if you look at the quadrants, you can see the scientific developments and evolution of one side. And you can see the software that comes with the different hardware as development and evolution moves forward. But it's interesting that all of these get agentic names. 
individualistic ideas. They all have this concept of a person projected onto the, all the meanings. So atoms have prehension and molecules have irritability, which, you know, these are some chemistry things. It just means they react to their environment. Sensation, like a plant, has the ability to sense the sun, things like that. Then the beginning of perception comes online. Impulses, emotions, and then eventually symbols, concepts, all the way up. Different stages of cognitive development. That's the development of consciousness through time through form. We are the universe becoming conscious of itself. We didn't come into the world, we grew out of it. In the same way that apples grow out of an apple tree. We're organically related to the whole. Four billion years ago, the earth was molten rock, and now it sings opera. You take a great cloud of hydrogen gas, and you just leave it alone and it becomes rose bushes, giraffes, and human beings. And this there's no debate about. The universe as a whole has gone from simple atoms to more complex atoms, to molecules, to more complex molecules, to creatures, to more complex creatures, to societies and more complex societies. And we are part of that process. Human beings are literally the universe after some 14 billion years of unbroken evolution now becoming conscious of itself. All of these things have arisen, but they have arisen within matter in the same way that right now you're watching this video on your computer. It's happening through the hardware. It's not that consciousness is the source of matter, it's that consciousness is the byproduct of matter. And think about the scale of human development. When you're pre-egoic, and you're learning in the, in the early stages of your life, you're moved by impulses and instinct, your animal nature. And that, let me, that, let's be honest, we all are, right? But then we're initiated into culture and we get a lot of conditioning. So lots and lots of cultural conditioning. And even if you get to the point where you are at the highest stages of human development, you haven't escaped that hermeneutic circle. You just have more and more and more conditioning, so many different human perspectives to the point where you have put them in some kind of a, a meta perspective. But even still, that meta perspective is informed by all those perspectives. There's no way out of it. So my point here is where is the free will when on one hand you're moved by instinct and on the other hand you're, you're more and more and more culturally conditioned. So if your responses are all moved by instinct from the bottom up and conditioning from the top down and somewhere in the middle arises the self as we know it. I think it's better to think of ourselves as a part of an unfolding process than it is to think of ourselves as individuals. In fact, this idea of a individual soul and an idea of ourselves in that way that we project onto all of these creatures at every stage of development and the universe itself that fundamental confusion about what we are is based on living in a time when we were unaware of the macrocosm and the microcosm. So we didn't really understand our place in this unfolding context like we do now. And so we really have to expand our concept of what it is to be a self in the world, as well as put these old school ways of understanding our world in perspective and realize that we should know better by now. Uh, I, I think you actually don't need a notion of free will in order to have a, a, a notion of moral truth, and this is something that is, is very counterintuitive to people, but we know free will is a non-starter philosophically and scientifically. Now, many people struggle not to admit this, but however our mental life is caused, it is caused either by prior causes or by some randomness intruding, but the, whether it's purely deterministic or there's determinant causes combined with some randomness, neither offer 
a, a, a space for free will to operate. I mean, just imagine if all of your experience were caused by someone at a computer just, just determining what you feel and do and say and want. Um, that's clearly not a circumstance of, of free will. Now imagine if that person just was determining and all that, but 10% but, but of the time threw some dice or introduced some other mode of randomness into the process. That doesn't open up a space for free will. And we know, just as a matter of scientific fact, that everything you're consciously intending to do and wanting to do and, think, and judging to be good or bad is preceded by neural events of which you're not conscious uh, and of which you are not the author. You are, we, we, we walk through life feeling that we're the conscious author of our thoughts, but you, don't think of, you can't think a thought before you think it. So, so, so here's a, an experiment in free will. Think of, think of a famous person. So do you have a famous person in mind? Well, why didn't you think of another famous person? I mean, you can't account for, if you thought of Ricky Gervais, you can't account for why you didn't think of Eddie Izzard. And that, that goes for every other move you might make that, that's starkly voluntary. You are, so things simply spring into consciousness. Now, the reason why this is not morally important is what we condemn in other people is, is not the fact that they really are the, the, the ground cause of their actions. What we condemn are, are intentions to do harm. And intentions are still part of the causal uh, framework. I mean, I, I only reach for this water because I, I intend to reach for it. I want, I want to drink it. Um, it's not like I can just sit back and wait and see what happens. And the only way to get to the water is to intend to, to drink it. Uh, and so what we condemn in, in an evil murderer is not the fact that he truly and really and metaphysically is the source of his action. I mean, all these evil murderers have either bad genes or bad parents or bad lives or bad ideas or some combination thereof, and they're not the author of any of those things. Uh, but we still need to lock them up. When you, go, when you go to death row and you interview the sociopath and you ask him, what, is, what are you going to do when you get out? And he says, I'm just going to keep raping and killing people. That makes, should make it pretty clear that you want to keep him in there. But we would keep earthquakes and hurricanes in prison if we could. And we would never think they're evil earthquakes or evil hurricanes. Some things would change about our, our notion of, of retribution, say, but the idea that we would have to lock up killers is not one of them. You know, it's not just that we're really complicated stuff. We're also a collection of ideas and concepts. But remember, self is really just a concept in the mind. It's something that's cultural, but also personal, and also based on, you know, the mythology of of our vehicle, the body, and its adventures through time. This all helps to shape our concept of self. So we're not just individuals, but we're a part of a process that's refining in a biological way, through genes, through form, and in the noosphere, in the realm of ideas and archetypes. I do believe that the, the noosphere is a real thing, kind of like the internet is a real thing. But the internet is not a magical thing, it doesn't, it's not an actual place that you can go. Much like the archetypes of the collective unconscious exist in individuals and in artifacts, the internet exists as a collection of computers that are connected to each other and web pages and things like that that are hosted on those computers. But you wouldn't reduce the internet to the hardware. The internet is not in the computer. They are separate things. The software is not the hardware. Just like consciousness cannot be reduced to the body. Did you find the files? I don't even know what they look, what do they look like? They're in the computer. They're in the computer? Gotta figure it out. In the computer. It's so simple. are cool then we're no better than the machine we got 30 years worth of files right here in this computer where'd all the files go i think a lot of people have this idea based on these old school traditional worldviews that what we're going to be able to do with this transrational ability is to have like magical powers beyond the the natural world and what I think that they're doing is they're overvaluing the individual soul and not seeing it as a part of 
a unfolding collective process for one. And for two, they're undervaluing the magic that is the material world. I hope you like that. If you want to check out more, check out my semantic compatibilism video. You can check out my short intro to semantic compatibilism. And you can check out integral epistemology and what all that's about. Lots of videos here to expand on these ideas if you're interested. Please feel free to dig a little bit deeper. I am David Long. Please like my video if you like it. Share with your friends. Subscribe. All that good stuff. Peace.